So you want to try and find a lender that will allow you to go through the stages with them. Episode 126. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking to property finance specialist Mark Watts about how you can finance your development projects and also how we can better understand our property developer clients and their financial processes and needs. Now, Mark works for Umo Finance and specializes in financial advisory, commercial lendings and loans, mortgages and financial consulting all within the property sector Uh, and in this episode Mark and I sit down and discuss the process that a project will go through in order to finance and obtain financial lending the different types of mortgages lending processes and financial products that are used by developers uh, and that we can utilize ourselves and the obstacles that many developers face when financing projects so sit back relax and enjoy mark watts so massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the business of architecture uk for the last couple of years big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events attended the webinars and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles and as you know we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you so what i wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and i'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and i'd also love to hear more about your business what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how business of architecture uk could be supportive of that does that sound fair brilliant so if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me i'm calling these calls the boa uk discovery call or just simply a chat with ryan use the link in the information and i look forward to speaking to you mark welcome to the business of architecture uk how are you very well and thank you very much for having me my absolute pleasure now you are the relationship director at UMO and your expertise and specialisms, if you like, are around commercial lending, um, mortgage lending, financial consulting, very much demystifying the business and property finance, which is, of course, of huge interest to us as architects because there's a growing trend, if you like, of architects who are wanting to become independent developers and doing their own developments either on a on a small residential scale kind of like what i've been discussing with you with with small you know uh, conversions up to much larger new builds and you know taking those kinds of larger sites and working them up and the finance aspect of it and of course our clients our developer clients can range from all sorts of levels of sophistication to national house builders um this, this question and the conversation around finance is often a mystery and we don't necessarily understand it. So I'm very excited to have you on the show today to kind of illuminate a little bit about how property projects get financed and things that we should be considering both uh, in terms for our, for our uh, clients and also if we're taking projects on as an independent. So I suppose the first question is, how, how would you describe what it is that you do? Um, that's a very broad question. It's, so we act as intermediaries, obviously, for finance. Um, what that means is that we've got a whole of market view across a multitude of different um, offerings on a finance perspective. Very often, I suppose, we provide solutions or we provide the answers to the questions. So invariably, we will get asked, is something possible? Mm. Um, And based on our market knowledge of of lending products, we'll be able to establish quite quickly whether something is viable commercially or not, certainly from a finance perspective. Got it. And, And what sorts of people do you typically work with and interface with? So it's a very broad spectrum. There's two aspects to, to what we do as, as a business. Um, the, the first side is your, your trading business side, which um, is working with trading entities that just need 
cash, whether that be to purchase assets, loans to acquire other businesses, that sort of stuff. So that's one half of the business. The property side then, um, we will get involved with everything from um, new property developers, so people who are literally just starting out and, and want some guidance and advice as to where they need to go for the right finance, um, right up to uh, more sophisticated um, developers who are doing hundreds of units at a time. Um, and we'll also get involved with uh, so one of the most interesting transactions in the last year was the refinance of a movie studio. Um, but we'll get involved in hotel developments. All right, it's not great at this moment in time, yeah. but um, yeah, that, that's the sort of thing. So it really does focus on the specialist side. So anything really from about 50,000 to buy a, a unit that you want to flip, you've just purchased an auction, right up to 50 million uh, and everything in between. So it's a very broad spectrum. Got it. Great. And what are the sorts of things that, you know, for, from an architect's perspective or an architect that's looking to get into doing their own developments, um, what are the sorts of things that they need to be considering when they first broach this conversation around finance? I think it's understanding what your ultimate goal is. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I sound a bit cliche, but you need to understand where you're aiming for to, mm. to be able to put the, the necessary steps in, in place. Um, very often we have quite broad ranging conversations um, and the, the easiest way to, to identify whether a project is viable or not from a finance perspective is to ultimately bring a project to the conversation. Right. Um, we can have very broad um, ranging conversations around the, what you can and can't achieve but the variables are so vast that that invariably you end up talking for about an hour and don't actually come up with a conclusion of anything. There are just so many you need to go and find a project and right. um, that sort of thing. So um, I think understanding what it is you're trying to ultimately achieve, yeah. having sight on a project means that that conversation will be a bit more specific and then you'll just learn what's achievable or not off the back of that one project. Got it. And, and so in terms of the, are the principles the same? So for, say, like, you know, a small terraced house where you're trying to do a, an extension for, you know, you're, you're doing a buy-to-let kind of model up until, you know, taking a site where you're going to develop a hundred to a few thousand units on it. What are the sorts of principles that are play, at play that are similar in terms of what's the linear progression of, of, uh, of, of obtaining finance, if you like? Um, on a refurbished basis, so let, let, let's assume that you were buying a unit that you were going to add value to and refinance or sell, actually. Um, okay. So you're going to buy um, a, a singular unit, you were going to spend X amount on it and, and ultimately sell it on. Um, that principle, from a finance perspective, is ultimately the same if you're going to build two and a half thousand homes. Got it. Um, however, obviously, the complexity on how you deliver that is, is very, very different. Ultimately, there are three key numbers that are, are most relevant. There's three um, key pieces of information that you need to consider, whether you're looking at a single unit or multiple units, how you deliver that is very different, but the, the core principles are what are the purchase price, how much are you spending on it, so what are the bill costs, and then lastly, the GDD, so what is the end value of the property? you need to make sure that those ratios fall within the parameters of a lender right. uh, from that perspective. So they refer to as obviously loan to value, purchase price, loan to value, um, loan to cost ratio, and then loan to GDV. So those three ratios will determine whether a lender's, uh, will determine a lender's appetite for doing that transaction. Obviously how you deliver that through the necessary phases from one unit is far more straightforward than um, two and a half thousand units yeah. and that's where developer experience really does come in so you, we can present any transaction that satisfies the numbers the lender then takes a very deep look into the experience of the developer and whether they have the ability to deliver that project got it so the developer the, the lender essentially is always kind of measuring the risk of what it is that they're lending against essentially yeah sure so does it um you know, some will only do residential, some will do mixed use, some will do commercial. Um, does that fall into their appetite? I can't stress enough, though, how important it is that experience from a developer's perspective is taken into consideration. That will influence the price and that will influence the amount of lenders that are available to you. Doesn't mean that you can't get a project off the ground as a new developer. Mm. It just means that you're probably going to pay a premium on your interest. 
right. um, and they're probably going to be a bit more restrictive as to the the ratio that whether they will allow you to get to the top of the ratios. Got it. So in in terms of having kind of uh, professional experience within the construction industry and delivering buildings, perhaps not on the development side, but say as an architect where you you kind of walked projects through, does that kind of experience get taken into account from the from a lender's perspective? Absolutely. So very often we'll identify skills gaps in the developer themselves. So they could be an ind- an individual, for example. Um, I've got a client that's an electrician, um, very good electrician, uh, successful business, and now wants to step into property developing. Obviously, mm. he's been he's on site and he, he kind of knows what he's looking for there. Um, he's bought a parcel van and wants to put four units on there. Um, we've identified, obviously, that he probably can't build the units himself. Yeah. But he, he knows enough about it to get it, to get it off the ground and he's got enough cash to invest. What we then look at is who is he going to bring in around for his support so we will then put together a deal team, if you like, or encourage him to put together a, a deal team. And that will form, uh, consist of his, his architect, perhaps a QS. Um, who's his contractor? What's the contract that he's doing there? Is it a fixed price contract? And we can sort of, sort of, sort of overlay the, the skills that he hasn't got to, to make that a viable project going forward. Got it. And if you're approaching a lender, what kind of thing do you need to be bearing in mind in terms of your own financial health like what 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 things are people going to be looking at to see if it's a viable project or, or how risky you are to be able to lend money to that differs on the size of of you as a as a firm and, right. and whether you're an individual doing a project or whether you are a national developer um at the smaller end the directors will will be the focus of attention uh, for their own credit health so personal credit files are important. Um, I appreciate that some people may have had some bad luck in the past and, and there might be some blips on that. Um, my advice on that is really to bring those out at the very early stage of a process because the lender will find out. Right. So I was trying to, to hide behind that. Um, what what, kind, what kind of blips are we talking about? Um, we, we, have, you know, we, we deal with construction is notorious for um, people perhaps having the odd CCJ. Yeah. Um, in the day, especially if it was pre two thousand eight, yeah, um, you know, that that's very often we've got construction uh, firms that were around at that period and have have taken a hit, perhaps not through their own fault, um, defaults, those sorts of things that we need to be mindful of. The other thing is they will also look at if you've got a, a history of dissolved companies. Um, there might be perfectly legitimate reasons for that. We just need to understand what that is all about. Got it. Yeah, um, and also if you have had a um, if you have had a bad experience, we, they don't like to see sort of HMRC arrears and, and people being left without being repaid. Right. Okay. So outst- outstanding da- debts is going to be a, a major red flag, if you like. Absolutely. What what they look at is the integrity of the individual. We all know that people there are bumps in the road. It's the integrity of the individuals to repay the creditors. Right, got it. Um, so that helps. And, and in terms of the types of finance that people will be looking for, say, say if we use the example of a um, of a, a, source, a, a small single unit to to begin with, what's the difference between some of these terms, such as a as a mortgage, as as bridging finance? What are the difference between these different types of loans? Okay, so it's the affordability assessment, or the the way in which they they currently get assessed. Um, a bridging loan is what they call just a, a straightforward loan-to-value loan. So what is the asset worth? Let's assume it's 100000 in this instance. And what is the lender prepared to lend as a maximum loan-to-value on that property? They will obviously ask how are you going to repay and so on and so forth. However, they just want to know is the, is the asset worth what it's worth versus what the loan is going to be. If you can't repay the loan, obviously nobody wants to repossess property, but that's ultimately what they're going to look at, sell the property, and that's how they're going to get their money back. Um, The danger of that versus a mortgage is that you can borrow money on a property, let's say that's worth 100,000, you borrow 75,000. However, when you come to refinance that onto a mortgage, the rental income perhaps wouldn't be enough to service what will then be a mortgage. Right. Okay. So on a mortgage, um, you can still borrow up to the maximum LTV as long as the rent, the rent income, 
services the loan at that level. So in Wales, for example, it's not so much of a challenge because property prices are much smaller. Yeah. £150,000 property, you'll still achieve six £600 a month, something around that region, which will usually comfortably service a mortgage over, over a sensible period. Whereas you go to London, for example, where property prices are perhaps um, a lot higher, but the rents is disproportionately lower. You're right. Um, that's where you tend to find an issue. So places like Wales, it, it really doesn't become a problem. Um, it's where the, the, the house values are perhaps higher, but the rents just won't come up high enough to service it. So you can end up in a position, if you're not careful, mm -hmm. is that you take a, a full maximum LTV loan on that property. However, the rental income won't allow you to refinance all of that mortgage back out. Right. Okay. So you're kind of, you're kind of trapped in that, essentially. Uh, absolutely. And sale then is your only exit. Right. Okay. So you have no or little hope of retaining it unless you have additional cash to put into the transaction. Got it. Got it. And so, the, and so, and so, bridging finance would be like what it, I suppose what it describes. It's a it's a shorter term type of loan that's allowing you to facilitate the construction of a project. And then what you would do is is refinance. Or how how do you end up structuring different? Do do you end up having different types of loans for different parts of the project? So there might be one type of loan for the acquisition of land, and obviously, once you buy a piece of land, it could be worth you know a hundred grand. But you've got some design ideas that's saying that it could be worth this. But there's so many unknowns at this stage because you don't know what planning is going to be like. You know, your appraisal process might be saying, well, we're going to fit, you know, we're going to fit thirty units on it, and then planning kind of turns around and says. Nah, absolutely no way. You're going to get you're going to get two on it. So yeah. there's a, there's a huge disparity there between knowing what the GDV could be before you've gone through any of the the formalised statutory approval pr approvals. So so are there different bits of finance that relate to the different elements of the construction process? Absolutely. So bridge lending is typically used um, for land acquisition. Right. Um, land acquisition, but let's, certain lenders won't allow you to do it without planning. Some will do it with without as well, um, but the ratios are, are going to be very different as to what they will actually allow. Um, so they, you've got bridging finance, development finance, and ultimately mortgage. Right. Um, bridge, a bridge is typically used, as you say, for just acquiring land or a property that is not mortgageable for any reason. Um, and they will normally allow some light works within that bridging finance product, if you like. Um, where the works are more substantial, then we need to perhaps step over to a development finance type project, uh, type of funding. Um, and that is um, where they will accept and allow it. You're going to be knocking about the property. Um, because if you think about it, they've lent you money based on the property in its current state. Yes. If you're knocking walls down, you can ultimately devalue the property temporarily. They, they're not going to be too happy about it if they weren't aware of the front end, what you were just about to do. Um, and it'll be priced accordingly based on that risk. So what they'll want to know is, have you got the money to do the work or do you need to borrow it? And then we'll, we'll go on to a development finance route um, from that perspective. Then once you've got the finished product, that's where mortgages come back into play. That's mm -hmm. where you can put tenants in them. Um, if it's a large scheme and you plan on retaining the majority of the schemes, they're ready for tenants to go in and we can convert them back over to mortgages. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, so the lender is always, they're always basing their loans on not what's possible necessarily, but what's the current state of, of the asset essentially, because that's how they need to protect themselves. Yeah. So what does it look like now? What is going to happen with it? Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll have monitoring surveys that will come out if that work is substantial enough yeah. to make sure that the work is to the right standard, the right money is being spent in the right areas. Um, I guess what they're protecting is that they don't draw down tranches of money um, and understand that nothing's happened to the property. Got it. So, I mean, it's interesting to consider, like as a hypothetical here, um, you know, if, if you're an architect, you found a plot of land and you're looking to you're looking to acquire it. Now, you've, I suppose you've got a number of options. You could just buy it. If, if you were just to buy it outright, you know, you've got a hundred thousand pounds sitting in the bank, you can buy it outright. There's a kind of ease with that because now you're, you know, you're not, it's not costing you anything to hold the land and then fight with it through, through planning. And, you know, obviously pre-planning is often where lots of developers 
struggle with liquidity and, and confidence from investors because there's nothing certain in place yet. It's kind of still unknown. So, so those kind and obviously the, it's more attractive to buy a piece of land without planning in many, in many aspects for an architect because there's nothing on it. It's a kind of a blank canvas. Um, if you don't have the money in the bank sitting there, what sorts of options are available to you to buying an empty piece of land? And then what would you, what would you then look to do after that? Um, I suppose there's a lot of answers to that which don't relate to finance. Um, right. So for example, um, we've come across cases where there are joint ventures with a landowner. Right. Um, therefore, you know, they'll, they'll inject the land as their contribution to the transaction. Um, and you may be the developer who's going to take care of all the bill costs um, and then you'll share the profits at the end of it. So that's one way that you can get your hands on on the actual site yeah. um, without any initial capital outlay. If you're going to go straight down the route of bridging, you'll need at least 50% of the value of the land anyway to contribute. Right, okay. Plus your planning costs and everything else that goes on top of that. So you do still need a, um, some cash to contribute. Um, there's also been instances where the sale has been subject to planning. So we've agreed that I'm going to buy at X price. However, I'm going to go get planning on it. And if I can't get planning, I'm not buying it. Okay. Um, that's been the sort of uh, approach as well. So those answers aren't really a finance related one. Um, it's more to do with what you can you negotiate with a vendor that they're happy with. All I would say is if you are going to do a joint venture with a, with a landowner, very often they want security. Right. Um, and they'll want to charge over the land, etc. Um, before they put it into the SPVs um, that, you, that you'll create. The challenge there is the lender wants first charge, so you can't really offer that to the JV partner Got um, on that. So I would suggest you probably have a chat with your lawyer around how you would structure that transaction to secure the individual, but keep the land free for charge for the lender. You, you just mentioned a term there, the SPVs, the Special Purpose Vehicles. Yes. Um, can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. So an SPV is basically a limited company that's been set up specifically for the purpose of that project. So it's it's usually cleaner. Um, yeah. The ownership is much more defined. It's easier for a lender as well to have a sight of what's going on. Um, if you bring that into multiple projects, it, into one company that's got various projects going on, one could fail and, and take the rest with them. Because right. it will absorb the cash that's available and, and cash flow. So the, the idea is that you would just ring fence the particular project. You'd have its own set of financials, its own ownership, its own security, and its own set of loan documents. Got it. And then the, the basically the, the individual joint venture partners become directors or shareholders in that in that. Correct, yes. Business. yes. So what you could do in that instance, for example, if the 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 landowner would donate the land to the SPD yep. um, and they would perhaps be 50% shareholder or 49% or however you decide to structure that. Um, then your shareholder agreement will determine who owns what within that. That just means that the land is there for, for charge for the, for the actual, uh, for the lender in that sense. Got it. And and would lenders be lending the SPV money or would they be lending the individual directors of the company money? How would that be assessed? Uh, so they'll lend direct to the SPV. Right. Um, so the, the, the company, the, the limited company will be the entity that's borrowing. Yeah. However, there is invariably, so they'll have first charge over the land that's mm-hmm. already in there. And there are invariably guarantees from the directors not necessary for all of the money, depending on the size of the loans. Um, on larger schemes, we see personal guarantees for cost overruns. Right. Um, if it's a small project and you're borrowing a couple of hundred thousand, they may take a personal guarantee for it all. Right, got it. Uh, again, it depends on your level of expertise and your experience as to what the security package will be. Um, they may potentially take a debenture on the property and what that, on the, the, the limited company. All a debenture is is a effectively it's a fixed and floating charge that means that the easiest way to describe it is almost like a company guarantee really so um if in the in an spv perspective it wouldn't be that many other assets to to have claim over so they wouldn't normally turn to a, a debenture yeah um but it is something to be mindful of so personal guarantees charge over the land and debenture are usually the three types of um guarantees or security that has 
is associated with that. Got it. Okay. So, go, so going back to our kind of hypothetical um, project, if you like, I found this piece of land. It's it's valued at around one hundred thousand pounds. I've got fifty thousand pounds in my in my bank to be able to put towards the actual purchase of the land. I found some bridging finance that can loan me the remaining fifty thousand pounds. Then does the does the timeline for that bridge in finance basically depend on the you know the work that I'm now going to do to get it up to planning? And once I've got planning, can I then refinance that that loan, or how long does the bridging finance last for? Sure. Well, most lenders will lend, and some will go up to three years. Um, I don't suppose you're going to want three years worth of. Um, money because that's going to accrue interest over the period right um the way bridging finance works you have two choices you can either service the interest okay so on your monthly interest you can pay that every every month which means that you get if you're borrowing 75 percent for example or, sorry in, in the land example you're borrowing 50 percent of the land value so fifty thousand yep. pounds you you will get the net proceeds of that loan because you're servicing the interest they haven't retained anything if, however, your preferred model is that you would like to retain the interest, what they will look at, if you take the loan for 12 months, they will deduct 12 months worth of interest from that 50,000 up front. And the net proceeds you get are what we class, what we call the net loan, um, which will be the 50,000 less the interest for 12 months and any arrangement fees, et cetera, into that. So you probably end up with closer to 40,000 than 50. Got it. If you repay that loan within the 12 months, you, you get a refund of the unspent interest. Got it, okay. From that perspective. So you, what you'll actually have, the, of that 50,000, you'll probably have 40, so your contribution needs to be 60. Right. Um, to, and that's simply to acquire the land. You'll obviously have a cost associated to the planning consents. Yeah. So however much that's going to cost. Um, and then, obviously, you want to, build out the, the scheme. Um, now, if you've already borrowed the money in the first instance, then there's a little equity in the land to leverage for the next phase, which is the development phase. Right. So you'll probably need a degree of cash because the, 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 money's, the, the money's are paid retrospective. Got it. Okay. So, ba so basically, you've now you've got a piece of land. You've, you're 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 paying for the, the you're paying for the finance for the loan. Essentially, if yeah. you if you get into any kind of trouble in planning, so for example, your scheme gets knocked back, and now it's gonna now this and this could obviously easily be a delay of between you know three months to another six months. You've you've still got to be servicing servicing your loan. Um, yeah. So you've got to bear that in. Bear that in mind, all these kinds of delays are going to be costing you because you've got a cost of finance on top of that. Um, but what, once there, once, for example, you've got planning permission on it, um, the the property value then raises. Yes. There's, there's kind of like, there's a kind of uplift, if you like, in the value of the property. Is that when you would then would you then be able to pay off the rest of your your bridging finance loan and then migrate it into a development loan? Or what would be the scenarios there that could that would be available to you? Sure. So, what you would traditionally do if if land acquisition is part of the development process, you probably are going to try to identify a lender that will allow the acquisition that will fund the acquisition and seamlessly transfer into development. Right. Okay. okay. Um, yes, absolutely. There will be an uplift in value as a, as a direct result of gaining planning. Um, not every lender will acknowledge or recognize planning gain really and other lenders will recognize it at varying percentages so some will accept 100 percent planning gain right others will completely disregard it what is there, um, is there reasons for that um i guess it's just the risk because it's there's a view of anything that what it's worth is you it's only worth what you've paid for it mm. appreciate your valued value through that aspect but it's i suppose at that perspective point there's no it's not a tangible value it's an intangible value um and on the basis that most finance of this nature is a bricks and mortar yeah type of lending it, 
it's that intangible value that people tend not to recognize. Um, and it's more to do with the more prime lenders. Mm. Um, high street banks, for example, I'm not saying none of them will, um, but they're priced very aggressively and, and very low margin. Therefore, they're not prepared to take that level of risk. They'd expect you to put a lot more into the transaction. Right, okay. Again, with really competitive rates. Because um, that's an, it's an interesting scenario because this often um, you know, can be considered quite an, a sort of, I don't know if easy is the right word, but certainly an idea that floats around lots of architects' minds is to be able to acquire a piece of land. The easiest way of getting an uplift in value is to gain planning permission on it for something and then sell the land um, at, a, at, a, at a premium. But the development lenders might not necessarily recognize that uplift in value. So it's going to be down to you being able to sell it for more than what you've invested into it, basically. Yeah, exactly. And and I guess one of the reasons for that is that planning consents lapse. If you don't actually build it out, then you've got to go back and get that planning. Um, whereas right. if there's a if the, the property exists on it, it it's there. It's, there's a tangible asset that you can use as security. So you've got a guaranteed value almost yeah. um, from that perspective where, as you say, yeah, it's an intangible gain really yeah. um, from that perspective. And that's why I would, I would suggest there's a difference in opinion. Yeah. on how you rate that um yeah right, that's 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 very interesting actually and obviously if you were to sell it as well to another owner they might not necessarily be interested in building what you've got planning permission for so yeah. that kind of exactly. impacts the actual value of it um in in itself yeah the other thing that's to be mindful of as well is and we we see quite regular is where somebody bought a parcel of land 20 years ago for right. twenty thousand pounds. Um, and today it's worth £150,000 just because of the length of time and inflation, etc. cetera. Um, lenders don't always like to recognize that uplift from £20,000 to £150,000. And the reason for that is there's no, there's no cash that's gone into that transaction to create the profit. So lenders like to see developers put their hands in their pocket and contribute physical cash. So... It's much easier to do a transaction where you bought the land last year and you want to build it out this year. Right. The, the numbers are are proven, so you, you we know how much you paid for it, we know what date you bought it on, we know how much you spent on planning, we know what the planning gain is. Yeah. And then we can sort of quantify that a lot easier. It's much tougher to quantify something that you bought twenty years ago. Yeah. And are trying to say now it's worth one hundred and fifty. Do what they want to see is actually how much have you put into that transaction to, to get it where it's at. It doesn't mean it can't be done, it's just it's less favourable. Um, and you may find some lenders will push back and say, well, actually, we'll only take the purchase price. Yeah. Um, and then that obviously wipes £130,000 out of that particular transaction. Oh, fascinating. So it really is the kind of, the more tangible uplift in value that can be seen and perceived and measured that's kind of what the lenders are looking looking for to mitigate their own risk. Anything, anything else is purely speculation essentially uh, and yeah therein lies therein lies the difference between the non-tangible uplifts and the physical bricks and mortar on a site and what they're looking at is if for any reason the site should fail you know and these things do happen for various reasons they need to come in they can't just sell a half finished site they need to come in and finish it yeah so the other thing to bear in mind as well is when you're doing your build cost what we often see is a developer will come with their own cost um, appraisal, but there's only a 5% developer margin in there because obviously as the independent developer, their profit is in the sale of the site. Right. Very often a lender will come back and say, no, we want to see a 20% developer margin. Even though the developer can build it for less, they'll assess it on their own margin. And again, that comes back to if the site fails or you can't finish it, they're going to have to pay someone else to come in who will charge them 20%. Right. Okay. So it still needs to be commercially viable for the lender to be able to exit, finish that site and exit it and still get their money back and still pay the developer. Got it. Got it. So the lender is taking on quite a significant risk because if the project does fail, they're going to be the ones that are responsible for basically completing the project. Otherwise, the site is completely useless. Yeah. And, and you tend not to buy half-finished sites because you simply can't warrant the level of work that's gone into getting you to that phase in the first instance you don't know what's going into the footings the drainage you know you weren't the one that's that's, that's warranted that so it's quite tough to pick up a half finished site 
Got it. Got it. Okay. And and so what what other things to um, in the in the development finance aspect of it? Um, how does it? How what, what sorts of rules and stipulations are involved with with that that you need to be aware of? I think um, in, in regards to that, obviously there's um, there's all the regulations around the building. Obviously, it's got to be signed off. There'll be warranties um, for for you as individuals, and ultimately, what the lender is going to look at is is everything from a regulatory perspective on building that site to make sure it complies, so that ultimately it can be sold at the end. What they don't want is to get to completion of the sale of the unit and then it falls apart a legal due diligence because it hasn't been signed off or something hasn't happened at that stage. So right. it, it's really about the quality of the construction that goes out so that we can get a mortgage on it at the end for, for the person who's buying it. Um, if, if sale is your exit or if you're refinancing it, again, that legal due diligence process will have to be undertaken. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing. One of the key things that we see a lot of is people underestimate just how much capital you do need to have if you're looking to undertake these projects. Um, I know we've got these sort of no money down deals, etc., cetera, mm. that, that gets floated around a lot. The reality is they're, they're few and far between. We do see a couple of them. Yeah. Um, but especially on larger scale developments, there is a significant amount of cash that's needed at the front end even if you negotiate the JV side of things, um, there, there's still a planning cost. You know, if the scheme's quite large, that's, you know, there's architects' fees, consultants' fees, yeah. everything that goes into that. So I think that's what we see mainly is that people really underestimate just how much needs to go in to make the deal work. How much would a typical development, and this is quite a, might be a difficult question to answer, uh, to answer, but how much as a percentage would a development loan typically cover for the con- for the for the construction would they go up to as much as 100 percent? would they always be expecting some capital from outside investment or private investment to be put into the project or can you get like a 100 percent loan for the for the build aspect of it yes you can so um 100 loan loan to cost is, is out there does exist yeah um so how you calculate the loan to cost is really quite straightforward uh in honesty um it's whatever the land value is, mm-hmm. if that is unleveraged, if it's no borrowing on it and you just own it, okay, you can add that to the bill cost. And as long as those two, those two numbers come under 80% or whatever the loan-to-cost ratio is for the lender, plus any sweat equity that you've got, planning costs, stamp duty, which can be added back in, as long as that's under the 80% loan-to-cost ratio, you effectively get 100% of the bill cost right. funded. Yeah. If the land, for example, is already geared up and we've had our 50% um, loan on there, then there's a little equity to add on to the costs, meaning that we probably won't get away with 100% loan to cost. We won't get away with 100% of the costs. Right. Because that 80% of those two numbers together won't be enough to cover it. Yeah, because you've already, half of it's not all yours anyway. Exactly. Right, got it. So it's like a kind of a loan on a loan, if you like. That's it. So if you've you've had assistance in the acquisition of the site or the land, in the first instance, it's going to reduce the capacity to borrow from a bill cost perspective. Right. If you've you've invested all your cash into that front, then the lender's quite happy because there's enough equity in the front end to give you all of the bill cost. Got it. Okay. That's really, again, that's, that's super super interesting to be considering like the the different aspects of of how the loans are going to be assessed um and once you've say you've completed the project um now you've got a physical tangible asset and you you want to rent it out now now is it possible now i'm assuming it's much easier to get a mortgage onto the into the finished development and and complete your development finance costs and and refinance it essentially is that a kind of typical process or people just sell it those are the two options, I suppose. Yeah, those are the well, I would. Yeah, the only two options uh, really is you retain it and refinance it, and and obviously get the the, the income off the back of the asset. Um, I suppose that will be very much determined by the scheme. If it's two and a half thousand homes, you're probably not going to want to keep all of them and rent them all out. Um, you know, that's a that's probably a sale um, strategy. Mm. Whereas if it's a, a, a Two, two units on a, on a plot of land, for example, then you're probably more likely to want to retain them and rent them out. Um, and it just def- it comes back down to what is the outstanding loan 
Um, so a lot of lenders will do maximum loan to loan to GDV, so loan to end value of 65%. Um, so the end value is, you know, if it's worth now with a 150, as long as it's 65%, most mortgage lenders will go to 80% on a buy-to-let mortgage, 75 to 80. Right. So we've got enough headroom there as long as, and it, it comes back to as long as the rental income is high enough to service that level of, of borrowing. So the LTVs will work, we just need to make sure the rental income works. Got it, okay. And I suppose what's interesting here as well is, and this might sound quite obvious, but there is, you know, and a kind of, if we kind of step back as a, as a generalization, is that there is literally a different financial product for each different type of intended use of a, of a property. So, if, you know, if you're just buying a house to live in it, that's one kind of mortgage. If you're buying a house to rent it out, there's a specific buy to let mortgage. If you're buying a house and you're going to be redeveloping it and knocking it down, there's going to be a, a different a different product available for that. So the lender needs to know exactly what your intentions are with the with the property from as early on as possible, essentially. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, you, even within just the buy to let sphere, there's there's more there's layers within that. So you've got HMO serviced accommodation, um, all, all considerations of different size HMOs. Um, all of that will come into come into play um, as well, and that will involve some level of experience as well. Um, so again, it's not just about the numbers. We we do still look at the people because um, it's the people that deliver the numbers ultimately mm-hmm. uh, and your ability to deliver that number. Um, but yes, there is very much a, a product for, so you may be able to do all of that with one lender because they have the, the different layers of, of finance available to them. So you may find that you will identify uh, a lender that will be able to do the development finance, but will also help you with the acquisition costs, if that's something. So you don't necessarily have to jump lender to lender. Um, and it would be ideal not to do that because you pay a set of legal fees every time you do it. You pay another set of arrangement fees, uh, another valuation cost. That can easily you know, pull away from your profits the more often you do that. So you want to try and find a lender that will allow you to go through the stages with them. Right. Okay. So you're basically you're, you're designing out the process and where the different phases are going to happen. And there's... And there's if, for example, you decide to sell something as opposed to rent it out, and then most lenders will be quite agreeable to renegotiation, renegotiating terms, or you could be quite careful with doing things like that. Um, so, if you, so what we tend to do is we'll map out both models. So, um, certainly on the smaller developments, okay, sale is your preferred option. However, what if the market changes and you can't offload them fast enough? how likely are we to be able to get your mortgage to at least get you out of the expensive finance and back onto something you're more, more familiar with, which yeah. is your two, three percent, whatever it is. Um, so we'll always assess that whenever we're doing a project because I mean, if you put all your eggs in one basket and that, and you drop that basket, then, then you're, you're stuck. Yeah. Um, and that's where you can run into trouble. So we will always have a look at that. Also, if you've got um, a site with multiple units on, the reality is you'll sell one unit at a time um, to, to a particular buyer. So you will then map out, there will be a portion that you'll repay back to the lender. Mm-hmm. Um, and that will be agreed at the front end um, for that. So it may be that perhaps on units of, of a five unit build, units one and two is 100% repayment back to the lender to release the titles for, for sale. Yeah. After that, they may ratchet it down to say 90% back and you retain 10 80, 70, because the loan is going to be repaid at the end. Got it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you. I, th- I think that's, that's a pretty comprehensive, I know, I know we've used kind of, kind of broad um, examples there, and then we could obviously go into a lot more detail if we had specific scenarios uh, and to open up. But I think that's really been very insightful in terms of the sort of principles and the mechanisms that are at play um, and the kind of complexity that can be involved in in the different phases of finance. Uh, I suppose my, my final series of questions is that we were discussing earlier that uh, you, Mo, and, and yourself, you're in development of a, of a new platform um, that's kind of geared towards uh, developer clients and, and being able to assist, assist with them financially. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about this project? 
Yeah, sure. So um, we're partnering with uh, a good friend, a good friend of mine uh, by the name of Dean, Dean Ward, um, and he's developed uh, a platform uh, which is very interesting, which is a land due diligence and feasibility platform. Mm -hmm. um, what that enables you to do is to, to put your site onto a, a project within within the platform, um, and it will pull in various different data sources to speed up the whole due diligence process. It will pull in planning permissions in the area, so what's going on within within a radius. Um, it will preempt the bill cost per, per square foot for that area, depending on the project type and the construction type. Um, it will automatically do the comparables, so once you've already put in it's a detached full bed house, it will pull in the comparables for the area. Um, so it starts to really formulate a project for you um, so that you've got uh, a good sense of the GDV, a good sense of the actual bill cost, uh, and obviously there, there is a residual land value calculator in there. Um, the natural conversation became then, once you've built that project and you've got it there, you understand the GDV, land costs, et cetera, is, well, who's going to pay for it? Um, yeah. or where do you find the finance? So we're partnering with them where we are, um, we will do deal matching in a sense. So based on the project that you've uploaded or built, um, and it'll ask you a series of questions around financials, it will then highlight which lenders are likely to be able to do that transaction for you based on the specifics. Uh, so that could be land acquisition, it could be just the bill costs, it could be a, a plethora of things really. Um, and we've mapped out we, we probably will launch with about 10 to 15 different lenders in there right. and they will be bridge lenders. They will be um, senior debt providers um, and mezzanine funders um, in there. So we've mapped them out probably to about 50 data points so that we can, we can make sure we're pretty accurate as to where we're going to go with that. Um, lenders seem very, very keen as well to be involved um, because of the quality of the data they're going to get, yep. which means that, um, we should be able to progress deals quite quickly and get yeses or, or indeed no's at a very early stage before you start investing too much time and money into a project. Great. Excellent. So, and is this a subscription service type of platform? Or? It is, yes. So people will pay um, a, a defined fee for an annual subscription. Um, there's different modules that you can bolt on or, or, or off, uh, as it were, to based on the, the level of detail that you mm. want in there. Um, as you say, what that does then, it pulls all the various sources in there um, from land registry, sales in the area, everything really that you would probably need or that you will need to assess whether a site is viable. Brilliant. I can see this this being a very kind of powerful tool, not only for the uh, you know independent developers or developers themselves, but also you know as us as architects being able to facilitate and be involved in the conversation around uh, finance with our with our clients as well. Yeah, absolutely, and I think because of the way it's laid out, you'll have a dashboard, so you can literally have you know ten ten projects on the go with various different. Um, different clients the features that we're looking into are making it a bit more of a communication hub as well whereby there will be a portal within each of the projects um, and you can um, invite key stakeholders perhaps the lender lawyers QS's any consultants environment environment environmental um, that sort of thing where you can just have everybody upload the information to one 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 place meaning that we're just trying to grease the wheels of communication here to try and get a deal to progress as quick as possible. Okay. Um, so, so that that's the concept behind some of the the upcoming features. The main thing we're doing at the moment is get get the land feasibility piece up, yep. get the lenders on board, and we can match the deals. We're concentrating on ground up developments only to begin with, and then we'll layer up sort of property conversion um, and that sort of stuff and commercial a little bit later on. Brilliant. Mark, thank you so much. Every time I speak with you, um, I'm always so impressed with your wealth of knowledge, your expertise, and the clarity with which you're able to uh, explain these things. So thank you so much for, for sharing today. I really appreciate your, your contribution. And I hope we get to do it again uh, soon. I'm sure that there's going to be lots of questions that will come in from our, our audience. If, if there are, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Um, I take a look at the website, websites, uh, umo.finance. Um, there's our telephone number and email addresses on there. Um, obviously you find me on LinkedIn. Um, be more than happy to have conversations with individuals, um, around any aspect to do with finance and, and development, whether that actually property or business, uh, finance itself. 
Brilliant. Excellent. I shall I've put all those details in the information of the of the podcast. Mark, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me again. Cheers. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.